What I want to talk about is I think we're in the middle of a bubble in higher education. Uh, college students are paying more than quadruple in real terms what their parents paid 25 years ago. Uh, we've seen students amass over a trillion dollars in student debt. That's more than all of the credit card debt in the United States right now. Employment is not looking as good for college graduates these days. There are millions of people who have jobs as waiters and bartenders, uh, jobs that don't really require a degree. And then even the schools aren't performing well either. So somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of all undergraduates don't graduate within four years. Um, so that's the economic story. And I don't want to uh, focus so much on that. I, I, I want to take a, uh, a different approach to the problem because I'm interested in uh, the underlying problem of education right now, which I tie to this idea of measurement. And I wanted to talk to you guys about how uh, our lack of measurement technologies uh, influence the shape of our institutions and their architecture. Uh, I think measurement is important because it's how we know who, uh, who's responsible for outcomes, whether they're good or bad. And that's especially true in the domain of education. So uh, wh what is the most prominent architectural feature on college campuses and the oldest? It's a piece of measurement technology. It's the clock tower. And that's for a very good reason. Widespread adoption of the clock tower technology in, mid in the Middle Ages was a huge benefit because for the first time, uh, it created a standardized measurement of time. It allowed people to coordinate their schedules. Uh, bells would chime, creating uh, discrete hour-long chunks that everyone could agree on. That settled disputes. You can imagine people before clocks fighting. I worked for seven hours. No, you didn't. You worked for six. How do you know? Well, they had nothing to appeal to. And so on college campuses, that became very important. It let professors, tutors, uh, and students figure out a way to coordinate their schedules and agree how long they had been studying. But the problem now, and this is what I find interesting, is that these, these old institutions linger in their effects so that the, uh, the clock in time has become a proxy measurement for learning. It's kind of crazy. We, uh, students take uh, hour-long credits for a season. They're tested in two-hour exams. Uh, they study for four years. Uh, it's, it's a very imperfect measure. And it doesn't really make sense. And so I think technology's uh, advancing to the point now where educational technologies, companies like Coursera, Udacity, and others that offer massively open online courses, we're reaching the point where the clock tower is becoming less important. And moreover, uh, they're creating a way to measure the rate of learning so that it's happening in seconds and minutes rather than uh, infrequently across months or seasons. So I'm going to take a, I, I think it's interesting that this architecture exists. I'm going to give a brief history lesson on, on some other, on, on why these buildings are so grand and why, uh, what that might mean. Uh, so this is uh, Admiral Claudesley's shovel. In uh, 1707, he had defeated the French at Gibraltar. He was sailing back to England, and on his way home, uh, fog engulfed the ship. He had no idea where he was, so he consulted with his crew. They tried to determine as best as they could, and they figured they were, uh, they were in open seas. Not more than an hour later, he ran aground on these islands, the Isles of Scilly, off the coast of uh, Cornwall, England. Killed 2,000 people, including uh, Admiral Shovel. And in the investigation afterwards, what, what the British Parliament determined was that they had no way of knowing where they were. They had no way of measuring longitude. He was totally lost. And so they set up a prize to decide who could, who could discover a way to measure longitude. Here's another admiral. This is, uh, this is Richard Howe. He and his brother were tasked with defeating Washington in the American Revolution. Uh, it's kind of small up there, but that's the, uh, the map of the battles that he and, he and his brother engaged with with Washington in, in August of 1776. Uh, Washington suffered a series of defeats. He was cornered, 30,000 British troops, 30 warships, 
uh, and the revolution hung in the balance. Washington made a last ditch effort to cross the Hudson into New Jersey. And Admiral Howe knew this was happening. He was downriver near Manhattan, but because there was no wind, there was nothing he could do. He could not sail his ships up to stop Washington. So Washington was able to escape and eventually uh, lead the United States to victory. Uh, now, those two admirals had their own problems because they didn't know where they were or they didn't have a reliable power, but this also created problems for the British uh, crown because what they didn't know, what the king couldn't tell, is if anyone was really trying out there. They had no way of measuring performance or monitoring it. If someone was, uh, if someone was at sea, they could be relaxing in the Caribbean. How do you know I didn't work? How do you know I didn't engage the enemy? You know, well, they, they got away. Well, it wasn't my fault. The wind wasn't blowing. Sometimes uh, we can't judge who is responsible for an outcome when uh, nature is confused with uh, the agency of our servants. And this causes all sorts of trouble because the servant can start to blame nature for the mistakes that the servants are making. They can hide because there's no way to prove it. And I think uh, uh, it's kind of interesting to see how this plays out, as I said, in institutions and architecture. And I think this is uh, how this applies to universities in a weird way. So I don't, no one makes banks like this anymore. 100 years ago, they had these very beautiful structures, very large and grand. Uh, they've, they faced the same problem I just described in a way, in that they had to convince people that they weren't going to run away with, their, with any deposits. They were kind of like a, uh, 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 the British uh, captain. Now, the, the, uh, the crown had ways of solving this problem. The banks had a way of solving this problem. They, it, it's a form of hostage capital. They made such grand investments in their architecture as a way of saying, we're not going anywhere. We would, if we left, if we took your money and ran away, uh, we would lose a very large investment. The British crown did the same thing. Uh, so they rewarded their uh, admirals and captains very well. This is uh, the Blenheim Palace. It was uh, awarded to uh, Lord Marlborough after a series of victories. And, uh, and it itself was a form of hostage capital as well because he couldn't sell this on an open market. No British aristocrat could. When you can't measure performance directly or people can, can lie and cheat because you can't detect things, you have to figure out weird ways of making sure that people perform uh, in your interest. So to go to college, w what happens? Who's responsible? The universities are our servants, but there's some weird blend of nature to produce some outcome. So what do universities do? How, how do we distinguish between that outcome and this one? So similar to the crown and the banks, the, the universities would invest in, in a form of hostage capital and the architecture of trust. If you're a parent and you deposit your kid with us for four years, who can complain when, when the architecture looks this, this wonderful and grand? <laughs> but the future is going to be very different. Education shouldn't be based on how long or how much time we spend around a clock tower. There's an older model of skill. Shakespeare, excellence doesn't require a degree. Shakespeare didn't become Shakespeare by reading Shakespeare. And so you can imagine some of these uh, new technologies coming, coming around. They will allow for the uh, creation of credentials that measure skill and not the amount of time we spend somewhere. Shakespeare, sure, he could have had a credential in playwriting. He spent not one day in a university, and he's one of the greatest playwrights of all time. In Silicon Valley, where I work, we see this all the time. People leave school, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Ellison, the list is very long. Steve Jobs, people who do not have university degrees, but nevertheless accomplished a great deal. I work for the Teal Foundation, as was mentioned. We wholeheartedly accept that model of learning. This is a program that Peter Thiel and some of my colleagues founded. We pay 20 kids every year, $100,000, to leave schools, to start companies to start nonprofits. 
and this is the Voice X conference, and I just wanted to point out that that is the one requirement of our program, is that you have to exit institutions of higher learning. You cannot be a college student while you are in our program. And so I just wanted to say, I think this is the future. I think the clock tower is crumbling. And in 10 years, uh, Clayton Christensen, he he's a famous uh, author, he wrote a book on disruptive innovation. He coined the term. Uh, and just last month, he made the prediction that in 10 years, half of all universities will be bankrupt. I agree with him. So thank you. Uh, it was kind of a, a weird history lesson, but uh, I hope you agree that the clock tower will be missing in the next 10 years. Thank you. <laughs>